Good evening. My name is Rabbi Moshe Brisky. I'm the director of Chabad of the Keneo and the dean of the Keneo Jewish Academy. In addition to lectures and encounters with renowned speakers and scholars from around the world, such as the one we're hosting this evening, each semester, the Academy offers a full schedule of classes and study groups and workshops covering a broad range of Jewish topics and areas of Torah scholarship. Now, for obvious reasons, our programming is being offered fully online this semester, making all learning opportunities accessible to those outside the Caneo Valley area as well. So to view our 2020 fall schedule, please visit jewishacademy.com. Tonight, we're pleased to join with Congregation based Bitzalel of Los Angeles in presenting a very special Zoom discussion with world renowned lawyer, constitutional scholar, media commentator, author, lecturer, and advocate of civil liberties, defender of Israel, and champion of truth, the illustrious Professor Alan Dershowitz. I'd like to extend our special thanks to Ms. Jennifer Ellis for all of her efforts in putting this evening together. In a few moments, Rabbi Moshe Levin, the spiritual leader of Beis Betzalel, will set the stage for tonight's discussion by posing some opening questions to our guest speaker. And thereafter, we will invite some questions from our viewing audience as well, which you're welcome to post using the chat feature on the Zoom webinar platform. And we'll try to get to as many as possible. For any Jew, or for any American for that matter, who's tuned in to issues of the day, Professor Dershowitz really needs no formal introduction. Nevertheless, if you would permit me, there are a few reflections I would like to share on a personal level. For one thing, Alan Dershowitz is a longtime dear friend and enthusiast of Chabad. He has a warm relationship with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, whom I know he respected deeply and corresponded and visited with over the years. And over the past two years, I personally have had the opportunity to coordinate with Mr. Dershowitz on a certain matter affecting a Jewish husband and father who was unfairly targeted. And I've been deeply touched by his efforts to undo an injustice, motivated as by his own words, by Rahmanis for a family in crisis. Indeed, compassion and justice and truth are clearly the central passions of his life. I would also like to express how proud I am whenever I read Alan Dershowitz's writings or see his appearances on the world stage of various media outlets in which he so brilliantly and forcefully makes the case for the Jewish people and for the state of Israel. He's never timid, nor is he intimidated. He says things exactly the way they are. And I think that few, if any, can match his command of the facts, his ability to articulate the truth in an illuminating and compelling way. And of course, his phenomenal debating and lawyering skills. A large percentage of the more than 35 books Professor Dershowitz has authored over the years deal with Israel and issues of vital concern to the Jewish people. And an autographed copy of his latest book, Defending Israel, the story of my relationship with my most challenging client is also being made available this evening. If you'd like to visit Jewish Academy after the lecture, you can make your order there. The topic of tonight's talk is Chazak, Standing Strong. And while the discussion is likely to take us along many fascinating paths drawing upon Professor Dershowitz's experience in many arenas, the main focus will be on the challenges of standing firmly and proudly with our Jewish principles and ideals, combating anti-Semitism wherever it rears its ugly head, especially on college campuses, and showing our consistent and unwavering support for Israel even as these values continue to be under constant assault, either in overt and explicit ways or in thinly, thinly disguised ways. The truth is that these issues should unite all of us of all backgrounds and all political parties and persuasions. These are not Democrat or Republican issues. They are Jewish survival issues. Nobody understands and exemplifies the sense of priorities better than Alan Dershowitz. He puts his soul before his politics. I want to tell you that last year, Rosh Hashanah, in the wake of a series of horrific attacks against individual Jews and mass shootings at synagogues and Jewish establishments, I gave my high holiday sermon on the subject of anti-Semitism, which historian Robert Wistrich identifies as the longest hate. And one of the more powerful articles I came across while doing research for that sermon 
was penned by none other than tonight's guest speaker, an article which I quoted extensively from, with attribution, I might add. I don't want to get sued by the world's best lawyer. The article was titled, Are Jews Too Powerful? And the article addressed the vile comments on the part of certain members of Congress about Jewish money and influence by turning the issue on its head. And in this article, I'll just read to a few sentences from it. When I hear that Jews are too powerful, he wrote, my response is, we are not powerful enough. When I hear that APEC is too influential a lobby, I say it must become even more influential. When I hear that Jews contribute too much money to support pro-Israel causes, I say we must contribute more. And on and on the article went. The fact is that Jews have contributed immensely to American values, lifestyle, and success. You take any arena vital to the human condition, to science, to medicine, to religious, to economics, to technology, and we have had disproportionately a positive impact. So as Alan writes, we have earned the right to speak up and act as first-class citizens. You know, it was great sermon material, Alan, and a good lead into tonight's conversation. Thank you. With that, I'd like to turn the mic over to my colleague, Rabbi Moshe Levin, who will be leading the questions of Professor Alan Dershowitz this evening. Rabbi Levin. Thank you very much, Rabbi Brisky. Uh, the title, as you mentioned tonight, is Chazak, One Sheep Among 70 Wolves. And it, the Talmud is referring to, of course, our position and how the only reason we're able to survive in the language of the Talmud is because there is a great shepherd. And the great shepherd, of course, is the one who's protected us for all time. But God also asks us to do our part. And as Ray Brisky so demonstrated about you, Alan, how much you've done for the, in this regard, I wanted to ask you before we get into any specific questions, I want to ask a personal question. What is it about your upbringing that made you such a passionate defender of Israel and human rights? Well, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. As both rabbis have indicated, I am a strong supporter of Chabad. I work daily with Aleph on behalf of Jews who are imprisoned around the world. I do all that work pro bono, and I hope to continue to do it for many years to come as I do my work on behalf of Israel. I was so lucky to grow up in, I was born in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, and I grew up in Borough Park um, as a modern Orthodox Jew, although some of my family members were um, what they called themselves Malachim. They were Misnagdim, Malachim, not Hasidim, but uh, equally learned and very, very religious. My family was very Orthodox. I went to Yeshiva Eitz Chaim. First, I went to Yeshiva Torah Samus, and I learned Yiddish. And then my parents switched me to a Hebrew school, Eitz Chaim, and then I went to Yeshiva University High School. Uh, I was not a particularly good student at Yeshiva because um, I tended to be a fighter, and I fought with my teachers, including my rabbis. But when I was 13 years old, I got a message. And the message was, what was my bar mitzvah, Sedra? My bar mitzvah, Sedra, was shoftim. Shoftim. Tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. Uh, the rules of being an advocate for justice. And I took that as a message. I took that as a calling. And all of my life, I believed in defending the underdog. My father, was the oldest of a large family. He had an older brother who was very sickly. So my father was functionally the oldest of seven. And his job was to protect his younger siblings. And he was the one who would go out and fight the bullies that were anti-Semitic. And my father taught me how to box at a very early age and taught me always to defend myself and to speak up on behalf of Jewish values. My mother, my grandparents, my grandparents, helped to found the Yeshiva Torah Vadas in Brooklyn and the Young Israel of Brooklyn, the first uh, Young Israel anywhere in the world. Um, and, um, and in fact, my parents met each other because both of their fathers were active in both Torah Vadas and Young Israel. So I, I come from a family of some, some degree of Yichus, uh, and uh, I didn't serve their interests very well when I was a Yeshiva student. Uh, but I became a very, very good student after I left yeshiva and went to 
uh, Brooklyn College and then Yale Law School. Uh, for the first few decades of my professional life, certainly the first decade, uh, Israel didn't really need much of a defense and Jewish values didn't need much of a defense. We were living in a golden age. Everybody liked Israel. Everybody supported Jews. We were seeing the end of discrimination. And so I devoted much of my life to defending the rights of uh, other people. I did not stand idly by the blood of my neighbors. And I went down south and I fought for civil rights and I fought against the death penalty and I fought against uh, discrimination against African-American people in the criminal justice system. But after the 1967 war and starting in the early 1970s, when I saw the academic community begin to turn against Israel, I switched my priorities. I continue to defend people of every background, but I prioritize my defense to uh, Jewish values and to values in support of Israel. Uh, some of the highlights of my life were meeting the great uh, Rebbe. I met him uh, with Justice Goldberg when he was running for governor of New York. I then met him when I was fighting for Soviet Jewry and the Rebbe and I had different approaches to Soviet Jewry. I believed in lawsuits and demonstrations and the Rebbe believed in behind the scenes diplomacy and we met and we had a wonderful conversation and I left the conversation feeling that the Rebbe was doing an enormous amount of good and that I hoped he would believe that maybe I was helping his diplomacy behind the scenes by being a little bit more overt and going to the Soviet Union on a number of occasions and representing people like Anatoly Sharansky and, and others uh, who were fighting for their freedom and for their right to emigrate to Israel. So my upbringing was crucial. I grew up right after the Holocaust. I was born in 1938, I'm 82 years old. Much of my family uh, was destroyed in the Holocaust. If you're in the Los Angeles area, many of you probably know um, my uh, cousin, Svi Dershowitz, who was the emeritus rabbi at Temple Sinai. His I think family, he's on with us tonight. He's listening. Oh, I hope so. He's a wonderful, wonderful man, a great rabbi, great scholar, and just a real mensch. And his family was living in Birno, Czechoslovakia. And my grandfather found out about his cousins in Birno, Czechoslovakia, and created affidavits for all of them to come to America. He went to all the shuls in the neighborhood, all the houses in the neighborhood. And he said, you have a basement, it's now a shul. You need a rabbi, you need a rebbetzin, you need a sheikh, you need a mile, you need somebody to take care of your mikvah. They said, mikvah, we don't have a mikvah. You have a mikvah, send us an affidavit. And uh, 27, 28, Rabbi Dershowitz will know the exact number, uh, were, were saved. And there's a fascinating story. One of them was left behind. Her name was Anne Dershowitz, um, related. And, and she was stuck in Przemyśl, Poland because she was studying the violin. And so my grandfather wouldn't give up on her. And he sent his oldest unmarried son, my uncle Menashe, rabbi, to the belly of the beast, to Poland, to find this young woman and marry her on his American passport and bring her back. And so they had a fake wedding, uh, as I understand the story, and they got on the boat together and on the boat, they fell in love. And when they got back to America, they had a real chasana and they lived together for 50 years. And uh, that's the story of my family. So I have a lot to live up to. I have a great family. My uncle Zacharia Darshav, changed his name from Dershowitz to Darshav when he made Aliyah to Israel, is writing a chronicle of my whole family going back to, as far as we can trace it, probably the middle of the 19th century. And I'm looking forward to reading that book. And I hope that I will be able to live up to the tradition that they started so many years ago. So thank you for asking me about my background and my heritage. You know, philosophy is autobiography and you can't understand a person's philosophy without understanding their life. So now that you've had a little bit of an understanding of my life and my background, we can get to the more philosophical and practical questions. Wow, that, that is really fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. I wanted to ask you specifically, you mentioned about how academia started turning against Israel in 1967. I wanted to ask you about the environment and atmosphere in college campuses. How has it changed in the 65 years since you attended college? And I could ask you about yeshivas as well, I guess, because you were a, you were a yeshiva <laughs> student too. I was a bandit, I was a bandit in the yeshiva. Uh, I can't tell you much about how yeshivas have changed. I think they've gotten much, much better. I can tell you one of the things I'm most proud of is when I became a professor at Harvard, I went to see the Dean of Admissions 
And I said, you know, I noticed that the entering class, it's wonderful, but you don't have any kids from Jewish high schools. Oh, are Jewish high schools academically decent? I said, yes, some of them are really fantastic. Uh, at the time, Ramaz was a terrific school in New York and some of the other schools and, and Yeshiva University High School. And I pushed him very hard to interview yeshiva students. And I think I helped uh, start the process by which today, uh, Harvard College, Columbia College, Princeton, Yale, um, many of these wonderful elite schools have uh, yeshiva graduates. In fact, now at law schools, Harvard Law School and Yale Law School in Columbia, we have even started to take some people who didn't graduate secular colleges, who just were Ilu Yim, brilliant, brilliant students of Talmud, and they've come to places like Harvard and Yale Law School and done extraordinarily well, because what could be better training for being a lawyer than being a Talmudic scholar of, of great renown? I remember one of my great privileges was I used to accompany Harav Soloveitchik uh, in the last years of his life. He would come down on Thursdays to teach at Yeshiva University. He lived in Brookline. I lived nearby. And I would pick him up and take him on the airplane and we would have great, great conversations and, 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 and talk. So the relationship between you know, Talmudic logic and legal logic is, is very clear and, and, and very close. But what's going on on college campuses today is a, is a shanda, is a disaster. Um, when I taught, I, I taught at Harvard for 50 years, I think I can say categorically, I never told a student what to think about anything. I never tried to use the classroom or the podium as a propaganda tool. My job was not to teach the students what to think, it was to teach them how to think. It was to teach them methodology, to teach them ethics, to teach them the right approaches to law. But I never tried to turn students who were conservative into liberals or liberals into conservatives. I would never express my personal views on any matter in the classroom. Today, the classroom has become a vehicle for propaganda. Students are graded down if they say anything positive about Israel or about Jewish values. Today, Jews are regarded as part of the white privilege and Zionists are regarded as racists on campus today. And campuses are dangerous places for a committed Jews. Now, you know, you can be a Jewish socialist, you can be a Jewish PLO supporter, that's okay. But you can't be a Jewish Zionist you can't be a Jewish Chabad person. You can't be a Jew who takes his Jewish values seriously and expect to have an easy time on many college campuses today. But I have to give enormous credit to the young people who are standing up against this. Students at UCLA, students at University of Southern California, at Berkeley, at Stanford, at Columbia, uh, who are visible and who are standing up against their professors, against their deans, against sometimes even the presidents of the university. These are our future leaders, men and women, people like Barry Weiss, who's a young woman who graduated Columbia and uh, quit the New York Times when she saw that the New York Times was a hostile environment, literally a hostile environment for a liberal Jewish Zionist like Barry. I used to be the, the most frequent op-ed writer of any lawyer in America for the New York Times. I had more op-eds than any other lawyer. Today, the New York Times will not publish an op-ed by me, certainly not about Israel or about Jewish values. And so we're seeing changes on college campuses, but the changes on college campuses are beginning to reflect themselves in the news and editorial offices of the New York Times, in law firms, in businesses, in the House of Representatives, and who knows, soon maybe in the presidency. We're not talking about politics tonight, so I'm not talking about the current election. I'm talking about 20 years from now when today's college students become the future leaders of America, and I'm very concerned, and that's why we need Chazak. We need to be strong. We need to stand up. We need to educate our students in high school, even maybe in elementary school, on how to fight back, how to use facts, how to use information, how to use advocacy against those who would slander and defame Israel and the Jewish people. So this is a perfect uh, setting and occasion and, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the topic of tonight's conversation couldn't be more relevant uh, on what's going on on college campuses today.
you know, Alan, I had the good fortune of hearing you speak when you were in Los Angeles last in, in February. Right. And I have to say that I was, uh, it was refreshing, not, not because of what you said necessarily only, but also because you were so forthright of everything you, your, all your opinions and, and all it's so incongruous with the, with the, with the, you know, the local thinking in many ways, of many of us. And I wanted to ask you, uh, for those listening tonight who attend college in unfriendly waters, would you tell them that hiding their Jewishness or their patriotism to Israel and trying to fit in would lessen the anti-Semitism that they experience or they need to be the Rambo fearless leader or of patriotism to Israel to be respected? What would you advise these college students who are in unfriendly waters? Well, they have to stand up. They'll be more respected if they stand up for their rights. And remember that you have a lot of support. You have support from Chabad on campus. Another one of the proudest things I did is I was the first faculty advisor for the first Chabad on campus when Hershey Zarki came up to Harvard and wanted to found Chabad at Harvard. And people laughed at him. Chabad at Harvard? Why would Harvard be interested in people with beards and, 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 and you know, Hasidim? That's not Harvard. I said, it is Harvard. I said, I have only uh, a couple of suggestions for you, Hershey. One, don't try to be smarter than the professors. We have enough people here appealing to the brains. You have to appeal to the neshama, to the soul, to the heart. You have to get below the head and to the real part of the uh, soul of the Jewish students here. And, and, and Hershey and Chabad at Harvard did such a phenomenal job that now there are Chabads on virtually every college campus uh, anywhere in, in the world, and, and Chabad has to be commended for that. So you have support. You have organizations like Stand With Us. You have organizations like APAC on campus and um, other organizations uh, like Chabad and Hillel. So you have people behind you. You have me behind you. You have Barry Weiss behind you. You have people you know will speak up for you. You're not alone out there, and please, please have the courage of your convictions. Nobody will respect you if you try to hide your Jewishness, if you try to hide your values. You know, the reason I wrote the case for Israel is a young student came over to me during the Aseret Yemei Tshuva and the 10 days of repentance and said, Professor Dershowitz, I need you to give me Tshuva to forgive me. I said, I don't even know you. Why should I give you Tshuva? He said, I've done something terrible. It's not that I've done it, it's what I haven't done. He said, I went to Ramaz High School. Um, I went to camp, a Jewish camp. I went to Israel on my gap year. I know a lot about Israel, but I am afraid to stand up and speak on college in classes, in the bull sessions, in the dining room. And I said, why? He said, because I won't be popular. Nobody will go out with me. So I started a campaign, you know, support, support Israel, data Zionists tonight. Well, <laughs> that may have helped a couple of Zionists on the campus. But I decided at that point to write my book, uh, The Case for Israel, because I wanted to give the students a weapon uh, to give them answers um, and to make them proud of their Jewish heritage. Look, no country in the history of the world, zero, no country in the history of the world. Last week we read Bereshit. I will go back to Bereshit. No country from the history of the world has ever contributed more in 72 years to humanity than Israel has medically, scientifically, economically, uh, politically, philosophically, literature, you name it, I challenge anybody to name a country that has done more for humanity in, in 72 years. You can't. Name any country faced with threats comparable to Israel that has ever had a better record of human rights, higher compliance with the rule of law, more concern with enemy civilians, taught how to fight terrorism legitimately without honorably, honorably, the way the Torah tells you how you fight wars. Uh, and, and so I'm proud to be um, a Zionist. I'm proud to be a supporter of Israel. I'm proud to be a supporter of Jewish values. And we have to instill that pride in people instead of making them cowards. I understand the cowardice. It's hard to resist peer pressure. It's even harder to resist pressure from faculty members. You gotta do it. You gotta do it not only for the sake of Am Yisrael, Kalal Yisrael, but you have to do it for your own sake. Because you, you won't be able to live with yourself. If you hide your identity, you should be very proud. Um, you know, I'm, I'm no longer uh, the Orthodox Jew I was when I grew up. I don't wear a kippah. When I was in high school, I wore a kippah. Even when I played basketball, I wore a kippah. Um, but when I go to places like France, I wear a kippah. Mm. I wear a kippah because I want to show the people of France that I'm not afraid to 
show my Judaism to wear it on my on my head. And uh, I will wear my kippah as a symbol of the lack of fear and a willingness to stand up to bigotry. Your, your work on uh, Chabad of campus is really uh, known and, and impactful, and especially considering that you were there in the beginning of Chabad at Harvard, you reminded me when I was a Yeshiva student in Yale University, um, I'm sorry, in New Haven, I did some outreach in Yale University before there was a Chabad presence there. I remember one, one uh, day, it was right before Passover, I was giving out matzah before Passover. There was one very tall professor. I asked him, are you Jewish? Would you like a matzah? And he bends down and he whispers in my ear and he says, Kofer <laughs> <laughs> I, I deny it all. Uh -huh. And uh, as you said, it's, it's not with the mind. We reach, you know, soul to soul, words that come from the heart, enter the heart. And deep down, we're all believers, children and believers. And I want to ask I have you a question. story, though. I have, I have a story to match your story. So I was getting an award some years ago when my mother, uh, Shalom, was still alive. And I was getting an award along with General Colin Powell. And so I brought my mother, as I always did, anytime I got any kind of an award or I spoke, she would always come. And my mother goes over to General Powell. My mother wasn't so tall. And General Powell is very tall and very elegant and very stately. And my mother says, General Powell, there's a rumor in Borough Park that you speak a little Yiddish. <laughs> and... Uh, and it was, he had worked in a, in, a, in a furniture store in Harlem owned by a Jew. And Powell stands up very strongly and says, Mrs. Dershowitz, I hate to disappoint you, but the rumor is not true. I really don't speak Yiddish. And then he leans over and says, Epis Abyssal. <laughs> <laughs> and so he knew at least a few words uh, of Yiddish and he, he was very proud of that. Okay, I, I wanna ask you a, a, a very broad question and I want you to please break it down because there are a lot of people um, all over the United States, uh, friends of mine, who are all talking about America disintegrating and it's time to leave America. And it, when isn't it, when, why shouldn't we learn from the Jews before the Holocaust who didn't leave Europe? How can we can't tell the signs that we see of antisemitism? Isn't now the time to depart and move away and go to somewhere else? to protect ourselves. And I, I, wanna, I want you to, to break down the, what you, what you see sure. the, and, and you know, the details of, 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 is there a difference? Is there not a difference? And, and, and- It's a great question. It's a great question. Look, if the option were moving to Mars or to the moon, <laughs> by the way, if we ever got to Mars, I'd expect to be greeted by a Chabad rabbi uh, who would be there before me. Uh, but there's no country, no two countries in the world better for Jews than the United States and Israel. By the way, you read Haaretz, as I do every day, and you think people are saying, we have to leave Israel. Look what's going on. It's terrible. Uh, Netanyahu is this, and so-and-so is this, and the COVID here, and we have enemies. You know, It's never been better for Israel. What Israel has done in the last few years diplomatically with the Gulf countries, I have played a very tiny, tiny role in helping facilitate that. Uh, which I, I really can't get into in detail, but I've had the honor of working uh, with the White House on the peace plan, et cetera. But uh, the United States is, is, is in a golden age for Jews today. What, just a little autobiographical vignette. I have to brag a little to tell this story and make it make sense. I was a terrible student in elementary school and high school, but I was a terrific student at Yale Law School. I was first in the class at Yale Law School. I was editor in chief of the Yale Law Journal and I had been selected to be a Supreme Court law clerk. That's like the trifecta. That's like being good, the number good one. Good writers have Gaiva. Huh, all, that, all good writers have Gaiva. Right, but no, that would be like being the number one draft choice of the NBA. The difference is I applied to 32 Wall Street law firms with all of those credibilities, and I got turned down by every single one of them. Right. Not a single Wall Street law firm would hire me despite being first in my class editor-in-chief, et cetera because I was an Eastern European Jew. I was the son of poor parents who didn't go to college. I had no, from their point of view, I had no yichus. From our point of view, maybe I did. So that was 1961, 1962. 25 years later, my son graduated Yale Law School. He got 32 out of 32 offers. Everybody wanted him. Uh, it had changed dramatically. The civil rights movement was very good for Jews. And uh, we no longer suffer that kind of discrimination. Law firms today 
Sullivan and Cromwell, which wouldn't hire a Jew back in my day, now has a chassid as its managing partner who wears a chassidish hat and has a minion. Uh, many of the big law firms now have kosher kitchens and minions. Um, everything has changed. It's far, far better. By the way, when you hear complaints from other communities, it is far, far better in America today for African Americans. It is far, far better for gay and lesbian Americans. It is better today for all Americans than it was in the past. People just don't appreciate it because they have no sense of history. Uh, I was early, earlier this evening listening to Barry Weiss. She was giving a, a speech and she was talking about um, the Eitz Chaim, the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh, which of course was the same scene of mass murder of Jews. And she said, the only silver lining and you know, there are very few silver linings to an event like that. The only silver lining is that it was not a pogrom. People shouldn't analogize it to a pogrom. A pogrom was when the police join in and the neighbors join in to kill the Jews like the pogrom in Kishinev and other places. Here, everybody sided with the Jews. Here, the police were on the Jews' side. Every public official, everybody condemned the act. And yes, you're gonna get individuals who in, engage in terrible, terrible actions but the community supports the Jews. The only place Jews aren't supported today are on college campuses and we have to fight that battle. But no, leaving America would be a dreadful mistake. Where would you go? France, England, where would you go? Greece, where would you go? Italy, no, go, go back to Russia, go back to Poland. Um, I recently went to Poland with my wife and my daughter. We had a commemoration at the Jagiellonian University of the Nuremberg trials, um, and it was a you know a wonderful event, and the people of Poland were so friendly, you couldn't imagine what their history had been in the past when you go to a place like Krakow today. But uh, America has been great for Jews, and we have to keep it great in a lot of different ways. But the most important way is by showing strength, by showing that we have the right to speak up. We should use our economic power, our political power our uh, educational power, our moral power to support and help uh, Jewish communities. Look, there are poor Jews. There's poverty in the Jewish community in some parts of the United States and we have to all stand behind them and make sure that no Jew goes hungry. Uh, no Jew is discriminating, screening, discriminating against Chaverim Kol Yisrael. Uh, we have to stand together. We have to be one, one country and we can't split apart. Uh, we know the stories from the Talmud about what happens when you have Sinui and when you have division. And um, you know, one of the reasons we don't have division today, it, I'm sorry, one of the reasons we have division today is that we're not facing any major crises. Israel is not in existential danger. The last times we got together really and were one community were in the 67 and 73 wars when Israel's very existence was endangered. The Soviet Jewry movement, when there were um, more than a million Jews who were being held captive, we united. Today, there isn't a unifying force. I think there should be. I think what's going on on college campuses should unify the Jewish uh, community. And I'm hoping that events like the one you're holding tonight will make us all understand we have differences. You know, on a week from Tuesday, some people are gonna vote one way, some people are gonna vote another way. What's more important is that we're all Americans. We're all gonna vote. We're Jews, we stand together. We wanna see bipartisan support for Israel. We wanna see bipartisan support. We may have differences in how we look at the world and we do have differences and we've become more divided. The world has become more divided the United States has become more divided in the last decade than ever before, but the Jewish community must stick together when it comes to important issues. Now, here's another issue that divides us, and it may divide us here tonight. I have an article that I just wrote this week um, to my fellow Jews in Borough Park and Williamsburg. As I said, I grew up in, I was born in Williamsburg and I grew up in Borough Park. And I'm on the side of the Jewish community when they say it is discrimination against them and how the COVID rules are applied. There shouldn't be different rules for a Jewish wedding on the one hand and for a, a Black Lives Matter demonstration on the other hand. You should have a single standard. I'm on their side when it comes to some of the rhetoric that's been directed against Orthodox Jews. But 
What disappoints me is that the leaders of the Jewish community, some of them have not done enough for pikuach nefesh. Remember what the Bible says, I have placed before you the choice of life and death. Choose life, ubecharto v'chayim, choose life. That has been so central to Judaism. And my message to my friends who I love in Borough Park and in Williamsburg is please wear masks. There's nothing in the halacha that says you have to have 10,000 people at a wedding. You don't even need a rabbi for a wedding under Jewish law. There are very few things that you need. You need a minion. So use your common sense, a little bit of seichel. Be apart, six feet apart. Wear masks. Put pikoch nefesh in front of custom. I'm not asking you to put pikoch nefesh in front of halach, but in front of custom, put it there. And I would hope that uh, common sense would prevail. So that's an issue that has divided. Uh, some of the communities in Brooklyn from some of the more secular Jews. And I want to end that division by saying I'm on the side of the communities in Brooklyn legally and politically. But in terms of medicine, I think you have to listen to the public health doctors. You have to make sure that you emphasize what the Rambam emphasized. The Rambam was not only a great rabbi, he was a great doctor. He understood, you know, you read all through Vayikra, there's all kinds of prohibitions on having people who have communicable diseases remain in the community and contagious. So our tradition is very much a tradition of emphasizing health, emphasizing life. The Talmud says, he who saves a single human life, it's as if they save the world. Everybody knows that part of it. And they forget the second part. He who needlessly takes a human life, it is as if they have destroyed the whole world. And so we have to put life ahead of custom during a time of crisis. We've always adapted customs to the crises the Jewish communities have faced over the years. We have to do that today as well. So you like to see from Jewish leaders in Brooklyn um, to ask in addition to what they're doing towards protecting their rights to also encourage their congregants to wear masks and social right. distancing. Right, and, and, and what I'm saying is the answer to inequality and they're right, there is inequality. The answer to inequality is not loosening up on Jewish communal gatherings, it's tightening up on the secular gatherings. Don't allow uh, people to have demonstrations where they're close together. Don't elevate demonstrations over Jewish uh, customs. Treat them exactly, have objective standards. No matter where you are, just if you have to be six feet apart, you have to wear a mask, we can have the same standards for everybody. Jews should not accept a double standard for their religious observances and their communal observances, but prioritize health. That's my message. Do you think that the increase in Muslims in the United States will change things for Jews? No, I don't think so. Uh, first of all, we can't generalize. Uh, not every Muslim is like Ilan Omer. Um, she is a bigot, she's an anti-Semite, and she should not be in Congress. And the Democrats shouldn't have her as part of their co coalition and nobody should uh, accept her as a legitimate part of the American democratic scene. She has uh, uh, lost all credibility when she talked about uh, the Benjamins and made other statements and her support for Farrakhan and other kinds of things. But um, you know, when I was at Harvard, I would go and celebrate um, at the end of uh, the meal, at uh, the end of the day of Ramadan. I would have meals with my Muslim students. And, and there, many Muslim students are, are, are willing to be supportive of Israel. Look what's going on today in the Middle East. Look what's going on, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates. These are all Muslims and Arabs. Uh, before long, I think the Sudan, um, I hope within the next year, the most important one, Saudi Arabia. So at a time when Jews and Muslims are having common cause against, in this case, other Muslims, Iran and others who would destroy the Sunni Arab communities, we can't look upon our Muslim neighbors as enemies. We have to try to build bridges to them. Many Muslims came and helped the Jews when there was that killing at the um, uh, Tree of Life synagogue. And we would do the same if, God forbid, a mosque was blown up. Uh, you know, what do you think the accords were called uh, when we, Israel, made peace with uh, 
the United Arab Emirates. The I love Abrahamic that. Accord. I love that. It's unbelievable. I know. It's Avraham was the father of the Jewish people, but also the father of Yishmael. And so, uh, you know, we can, we can work together. We have more in common. Okay. Um, there are some questions people are sending in. I want to encourage everyone who hasn't sent the question. We'll try to get to sure. everyone's question. But before we get to, to everyone else's question, I also want to ask you one personal question. Sure. As you mentioned, um, uh, you had a personal relationship with the Rebbe. You had an audience with the Rebbe, I understand. Can you please oh. tell us a little bit about, about that audience with the Rebbe? Well, I had, a, I had several, and I had some exchanges of correspondence uh, with the Rebbe. And, you know, you walked into that little office. You know, you think of you going to see the great Lubavitcher. Oh, let me tell you about my first time I ever met the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He had just become the Lubavitcher Rebbe. It was, it must have been either 19, either the fall of 1951 or the spring of 1952. I went to Yeshiva University High School in Crown Heights. It was just about a mile maybe away from um, where the Rebbe's house was on Eastern Parkway. And my best friend in high school was Tzvi Groner whose uncle was Rabbi Groner. And one day, Svi said to me, uh, my uncle, Rabbi Groner, asked us to come over and, um, and, and, and have we had a long lunch hour that day. So we walked over and, and we had a lunch. And uh, we were sitting and talking. And this man came out. We didn't know who he was. And he introduced himself. Uh, he didn't call himself the Lubavitcher Rabbi. He just introduced himself by name. And then asked me, uh, what? Uh, Gemara I was learning, and it was either Baba Kama or Baba Basra, I don't remember, one of the Bubba's, and uh, he asked me a few questions, and so I had a Bechina from the Rebbe, I don't know whether I passed it or failed it, but that was my first five-minute meeting with him before I knew really who he was. Then the first time I really met him as the Rebbe was when Arthur Goldberg ran for governor of New York in 1970, and uh, Arthur Goldberg asked me to accompany him to his meeting with the Rebbe. And so I spent an hour with Arthur Goldberg and the Rebbe in uh, the Rebbe's study. And then I met him uh, another time during the Soviet Jewry times. That was probably maybe 76 or 77. And then I had an exchange of correspondence with him. What happened is for his, I think maybe 80th birthday and may have been 75th, one of his important birthdays, they decided to give a big dinner in his honor in Washington, DC and, and honor a number of senators. And one of the people he wanted to honor was the Senator from uh, Mississippi. And the Senator from Mississippi in those days was not the particularly uh, a righteous man, we thought. Uh, he was a segregationist and uh, he didn't support uh, civil rights or civil liberties. And so I wrote a very polite letter to the Rebbe saying, you know how much I admire you, you know how much I respect you, you know how much I think your judgment is wonderful. I just wonder why you would have picked this particular senator from Mississippi to honor. And he wrote me back this wonderful letter. And I think Jesse Helms. Jesse Helms. And it's in the archives, I think, of the Chabad. He wrote me back this letter saying, essentially, you know, when we honor in Chabad, we don't honor for the past, we honor in order to influence the future. And please write me again in a couple of years and see whether or not this honor has had any impact. Sure enough, Jesse Helms became the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. He became a strong supporter of Israel, a strong supporter of Jewish values. I never again questioned the Rebbe's judgment, believe me. <laughs> wow, wow, that is that is a powerful, uh, wow, thank you for showing that. Sure. Okay, I see some questions have come up over here. Um, um here we go one second um someone is asking about fighting hate in colleges is it incumbent upon jews who support colleges to stop doing that in order to try to sway the colleges um towards away from anti-semitism it's a great question uh remember colleges and universities are not just the current student body of the current faculty Harvard University is older than the state of Massachusetts. It goes back to what, 1632 or something like that. It has a long tradition. It will be in existence when our grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. And so Harvard, Yale, Princeton, UCLA, USC, Stanford, these are institutions that are beyond the four-year students that are there now. And they include alumni. 
and they include contributors. And right now the schools are far too influenced by the current faculty and the current student body. So I would encourage alumni. Continue. Just wasn't before you continue. So I say, if people are asking to, to, to ask questions on the chat, just write the actual question you have. We, we, we're, they just type the question to the chat. Sorry, please continue. So I would urge uh, alumni and contributors to uh, condition their con contributions on making sure that Jews are treated equally and Zionists are treated uh, equally. Um, I was honored to speak uh, at the White House when President Trump unveiled his executive order, cutting off federal funding to any university that treated Jews and Zionists differently from other protected groups. And um, I think it was a very important thing to do. It was too bad we needed it. We shouldn't have had to need it, but we did need it. And I'm sure whoever the next president is, whoever is elected next two weeks, and whoever is elected eight years and 12 years from now, that executive order will remain in force. So I think we should use whatever pressures we have, if it's a state university through legislation, not to deny academic freedom, but to protect academic freedom. Because today, Jewish students who support Israel and identify strongly as Jews are being denied their academic freedom. And academic freedom doesn't only belong to the faculty, it belongs to the students as well. All right, Risky, did you also um, received some questions before you wanted to share? You're, you're, you're muted, we can't hear you. All right, Risky, are, are you trying to speak because we- on the, on you, There we go. Okay, is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, some of the questions that are being asked is concerning anti-Semitism. Do you see it as something that is a crisis today in America or controllable in America? Is it something that is just growing and growing? Or do you see it really that it is under control? However, every once in a while it spikes up. There are different kinds of anti-Semitism. When I was growing up, anti-Semitism was easy to spot. You couldn't move to certain neighborhoods. You couldn't move into co-ops in Manhattan. You couldn't get approval of the co-op boards. Your kids couldn't get into medical school. There were quotas on college campuses. It was obvious what anti-Semitism was. It came from the top down. Today, anti-Semitism comes mostly from the bottom up, from the dregs of society. So one form of anti-Semitism is what we saw in Charlottesville when people said we will not be replaced by Jews and when neo-Nazis and Ku Klux Klansmen marched. That's the, the shooting of the Islam synagogue. Uh, that, that's one form of anti-Semitism and nobody supports that. That's a tiny fraction of people who believe in that. That's a law enforcement issue. We are controlling that. We are winning that fight. That's easy. It's painful. Every time a Jew is killed, it's painful but it's under control. That's not the biggest problem today. The biggest problem today is anti-Semitism from the hard left, anti-Semitism on college campuses, anti-Semitism that makes Jewish kids feel uncomfortable with their Judaism. A third form of anti-Semitism, and here again, I don't wanna generalize, comes from limited elements of the Islamic anti-Israel community. You see polls show that there's still a considerable amount of anti-Jewish hatred that are taught in some mosques around the country. Look, tragically, you may get some anti-Muslim hatred being taught by some extremists among rabbis. We all have our own extremists and we have to fight our own extremists uh, from, from within. And I'm not making any comparisons here, um, but, um, but that, those are three different forms of anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism from the hard right is under control. We will deal with that. The anti-Semitism among Muslims is limited in its influence in the United States. It has more pervasive influence in France and other places. And I think that's going to disappear as Israel makes peace more and more with Arab countries. It's the hard left anti-Semitism that's the most frightening and the most influential and the one that we haven't figured out a way of dealing with and that's spreading and getting much more serious. If, if I can just follow up, and sure. I'm going to try very hard that this doesn't turn into a political discussion. Sure. But how did that happen? We were the party of Scoop Jackson and the party of so many great friends of, of, of Israel, Senator Kennedy uh, and his, his brothers. 
how did it happen this sudden change and again let, let, we're trying to keep this a very non-political it's, it's a great question look when i was growing up it was bipartisan yeah you had ted kennedy and you had jacob javits republican democrat they all supported israel people forget that israel's greatest supporter uh, was robert kennedy people don't remember that robert kennedy went to israel and covered the war of independence he was a staunch Zionist. I worked very closely with Ted Kennedy uh, when he was a senator. There couldn't have been a better friend of uh, Israel, as you say, Scoop Jackson, Pat Moynihan, um, so many people, Hubert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey was in Israel one day and planes flew overhead and he turned to the prime minister and he said, are they ours or theirs? By ours, he meant Israelis. I mean, and things have changed. And we, changed we can't forget because, President Truman. Right, yeah, but things have changed. Uh, the major change was brought about by a, by a Catholic priest named the Reverend Berrigan, one of the great villains of modern history, just not so long ago died. He wrote in 1973, I think, just before, just right before, right after this, 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 the uh, Yom Kippur War, he called Israel a criminal Jewish community blamed American Jews, said uh, we were terrible people. That was picked up by the Noam Chomsky's of the world, the Norman Finkelstein's of the world, the uh, Bill Kunstler's of the world, and, the and, and, and of course the Communist Party of Russia, the Soviet Union, turned against Israel after the 67 war. And remember communists used to like Israel. They supported Israel, Czechoslovakia under communism gave Israel its first weapons to fight the war of independence. That stopped when communists turned against Israel. When communists turned against Israel, the American left turned against Israel. When the American left turned against Israel, the Vietnam War veterans or the opponents of the Vietnam War began to become teachers at universities and had an enormous amount of influence. And so that influence has been growing. Fortunately, it hasn't really affected what most Americans feel, the vast majority of Americans, Democrat or Republican, are very supportive of Israel, but not on college campuses. That's where the priorities are. That's where we have to fight the battle. And I have to tell you, one of the reasons I am um, fighting so hard is some of you may know that a few years ago, I was falsely accused of a sexual contact with a woman I never met, never heard of. And uh, I finally found emails from her admitting she never met me, admitting she never heard of me, a tape recording by her own lawyer admitting that she was wrong, a tape recording by a best friend, uh, an investigation by the former head of the FBI. I was completely and totally exonerated, never met this person, never heard of her. But as the result of the accusation, I have been kept off college campuses because some feminists say, oh, he's been accused, he must be guilty. I wrote a book about it which you can get free on Kindle called Guilt by Accusation. One of the reasons I'm fighting so hard is I'm not worried about my reputation. I know I did nothing wrong. Since the day I met Jeffrey Epstein, yes, I was his lawyer, but since the day I met him, I have had sexual contact with one woman, my wife of 35 years. I've never done anything wrong in my private life. I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is my voice on Israel on college campuses is being stifled, which is why I'm fighting back, why I'm suing them, why I'm suing the lawyers, why I'm asking for investigations of everybody, because I need my voice to be restored, not for my sake. I'm 82 years old. I could retire. I need it to be restored because I have to go back on college campuses and fight the good fight and tell the truth and correct all the lies and errors that we're hearing today on college campuses. So I know I've gotten a lot of support in my battle from members of the Jewish community. I want to express my appreciation for your support and I hope you'll support. We continue. I want to look you in the eye and tell you, you will have nothing to be embarrassed about or ashamed of. I did absolutely nothing wrong. My accusers know that. The everybody knows it. But in the world we live in, in the Me Too world we live in, my voice has been stifled. I've been canceled by not only university campuses, would you believe I've been canceled by the 92nd Street Y, the major forum, when, I, when my book, which you have a copy of, Defending Israel, came out, um, I wanted to speak at the 92nd Street Y as I have for the last 25 years. I was the second most frequent speaker after Elie Wiesel. But the 92nd Street Y told my agent, we know he didn't do it, we know he didn't do anything wrong, but we have to cancel him because we don't want trouble from any of the Me Too people. So I can't speak at the 92nd Street Y, I can't speak on college campuses. 
I've been canceled in another a number of other forums, and I need my voice to be restored so that I can continue to defend Israel. And thank you very much uh, for addressing that. I want, I want to also ask you one more question. The sure. hour is getting uh, winding up. I want to give voice to a question that I think many in my community here in Los Angeles or in the entertainment industry have. Um, there's a question from this gentleman from Berkeley. He's asking, please address the problems and possible solutions regarding Jews in the entertainment industry and media. Well, you know, you have these idiots in the entertainment industry, people um, um, like the Jewish guy who just made the film American Pickle, what's his name? Um, and the other guy, Ruffalo. I mean, all these really ignoramuses who are famous because they're actors, but they don't know what they're talking about. And they have turned very, very anti-Israel. You know, in the old days, the film industry, Hollywood was very pro-Israel. Who was Israel's biggest supporters? Frank Sinatra, uh, Bob Hope, uh, you know, all the great names in Hollywood were supportive of Israel and supportive of Jewish values. Today, some of the biggest stars, I don't think any of them are particularly good actors. Uh, the guy I was thinking that before is Rogan, uh, I think his name is, um, uh, turned against Israel. Um, I mean, and then you get people, you know, even some Jewish um, writers and, and others. So it is a problem in Hollywood and um, it's a problem, uh, Oliver Stone, um, has turned against uh, Israel. Um, and these are not informed, educated uh, critics of particular Israeli policies. They're just knee-jerk, left-wing, anti-Israel uh, people. And, um, and they have to be responded to. Uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they have influence. Um, fortunately, there are Hollywood people who are very supportive of Israel. There is a group in Hollywood that's very supportive of Israel as well. So, but we have to correct the lies of famous actors and actresses and uh, who was it, a Jewish actress, um, uh, put Farrakhan's speech on the web praising it. I mean, she didn't know what she was doing. She was just a fool and an ignoramus. Um, but ignoramuses and fools who are stars in Hollywood have disproportionate influence on young people's attitudes. So. We have to address that as well. So how would you best think of a solution for that? The, there are a lot of budding, you know, producers who feel like they, they can't, you know, share what they're doing, their writings, their, their work because of the because of their political views and their and their and their pride in Israel. Well, you know, it's it's hard. We have to make sure we fight back. We have to make sure that producers, remember the producers are the ones who put the money up for the films. And there are a lot of producers who are, who are gonna be very pro-Israel and those producers have to put their money where their ideology is and not support um, um, uh, films that discriminate against Israel, discriminate against Jews or present a, a false picture. Again, to go back to what I said in the beginning, we have earned our power. Hollywood was a Jewish invention. It was invented because Thomas Edison was an anti-Semite and didn't allow Jews to be in the film industry he, he tried to build in New Jersey. When's the last time a film was made in New Jersey? So the Jews from Second Avenue moved to Hollywood and created the film industry. Um, and uh, we should now, now become victims of uh, an industry that our people helped to create. We have to fight back everywhere where the fights can be, take place. We have to defend Jewish values in Israel in every forum. Alan, if I may just uh, throw in, I saw a, a photo of you holding a Torah that yeah. the Aleph Institute wrote in your honor. Right. And on the mantle, it had the words Tzedek, Tzedek Tirdov, which you opened with as part of your right. bar mitzvah portion. It has been part of your life every single moment of your existence, because that was your portion of your birth and your bar mitzvah. Right. I want to bless you indeed that Tzedek Tzedek Tirdof, you should always find justice and in all of your work and all of your work on behalf of Klal Yisrael, on behalf of Eretz Yisrael, on behalf of humanity, you should only find success and tremendous Hatzlacha. Well, thank you. That's a wonderful blessing. Uh, and I take it very seriously because Tzedek Tzedek, you know, the, the, the writers ask, why does Hashem repeat the word Tzedek? And there are so many possible interpretations. I'll give you mine. Mine is that uh, you have to have justice, tzedek, 
for the real victims of crime, for women who have been abused, for real victims of crime, they deserve tzedek. But you also need tzedek for those who are falsely accused. And I will not give up until I achieve both tzedek and tzedek, because I take seriously my Parsha. My Bar Mitzvah was, um, I think my, what was it? My 69th anniversary of my Bar Mitzvah was only a couple of weeks ago. And I was up here uh, on Martha's Vineyard with my family and I laned uh, the portion. So, you know, I can still do a little of that. Wow. And I still remember my portion. And, uh, you know, I was a young choir boy. I sang in the choirs of Beryl Lachagi and Moshe Kusevitsky. And so I still, when we are in our house isolated, uh, I lead the services. I'm the Chazin, I'm the Balkore, I'm the Baltakia, and I give the, I give the drash. So uh, although I was never, you know, when I graduated, um, when I graduated high school, my rabbi called me in Rabbi Zura and said, you know, you got a good mouth on you, but you don't have a Yiddish cup. You're not smart. <laughs> he said, so we got to figure out a profession or a trade for you that you can use your mouth a lot, but not your, ma- not, your, not your brain. He said, so I have two ideas for you. One, you could be a conservative rabbi. That was for him the biggest insult in the world. Or you could be a lawyer. So I was never smart enough to be a conservative rabbi or a rabbi at all. So I had uh, to choose to be a lawyer. I think my grandmother would have preferred for me to be a rabbi, but uh, you know, I think of I think of my rabbinical background, my family's rabbinical background, my training in yeshiva, has been a very very important part of my success as a lawyer. So I want to express my appreciation for my Jewish heritage for everything. I'm sure they're all having nachos from you. Yeah, thank you. If I, I may share with you one story in the spirit of Chazak, in the spirit of your recent birthday, I think uh, if your parish was shaved him, then wasn't so long ago. Uh, I think you're 82, right? That's right, right. yeah. yeah. Gesund. There was a, um, a senator uh, in Canada, I think his name is Irv Gerstein. He uh, called up the rabbi of the Kotel and he asked him if he can come to Canada to uh, celebrate his 80th birthday. And the rabbi of the Kotel apologized. He couldn't come. He was very busy. He couldn't come. Uh, but he said to Irv, he said, you know, you're celebrating your birthday. Is there any um, blessing that you need in, on, in honor of your birthday that I could give you from the Kotel, from, from Jerusalem? So Mr. Gerstein says, actually, you know, I just started a newspaper in China and I need a blessing for this new endeavor. So the rabbi said, oh, I don't know how to give a, ber- a blessing for an 80 year old who's starting a newspaper company. I never heard of such a thing. How do you have the wherewithal to start a newspaper company at 80 years old? So, <laughs> so he responded, he said, listen, every birthday I have is hard for me. The hardest birthdays I have are the round ones, 30, 40, 50, those are the worst. When I turned, I think it was 50, I was so depressed, I couldn't get out of bed. And my wife was nudging me that there's a great grand rabbi in New York, the Obaba Chereba. He's very intelligent. You should speak to him and he'll give you advice of, of just, just speak to him. So Irv says, I, I told my wife, when he needs advice, tell him to call me. But, <laughs> but a Yiddish uh, Baruch Hashem, a Jewish wife knows how to, uh, to give her husband the message the way he needs to hear it. And he was on, went on a plane to New York and he went to the Rebbe. When he got to the Rebbe, he gave the Rebbe a pretext of why he was there. The Rebbe read through it. The Rebbe said, what's bothering me? So he said, I haven't accomplished anything in my life. I'm, I'm already this age. I haven't done anything. So the Rebbe asked him if he reads the Bible. So he said, I read the Bible, but not much. The Rebbe said, do you know who the most famous person in the Bible is? He says, Moses. He says, do you know how old Moses was when he began his career? Right. The, he didn't know. The Rebbe said, Moses was 80 years old. And let me ask you, the Rebbe says, why do you think Moses had took the responsibility of all the Jewish people at the age of 80. How could he do that? All the Jewish people, 80 years old, how could he take that such great responsibility in, in such a feeble age? And the, Rebbe, and the Rebbe answered his own question. The Rebbe said, because there are two kinds of questions people ask. There are questions that young people ask and questions old people ask. Old people ask the question, what have I done? Young people ask the question, what needs to get done? And Moses was a young person. 
And that's why he was able to take that responsibility at the age of 80 years old. So Irv told the rabbi the Kotel, he said, that's what carried me from 50 to 60 to 70 to 80. What needs to get done? And I, I, I hear from you loud and clear that this is what's on your mind. What has to get done? I have an agenda. I, I have a lot of years that I need to get because I have a lot of things I want to do. Uh, who is it who once said, I want to die young at the age of 95? Uh, and uh, we all, you know, we all wish each other many, many years of activity and productive life. Um, I want to devote the rest of my life to the kinds of Jewish causes and causes that have been a part of my life for so long. And um, I hope that Hashem will give me the strength to continue Amen. to do that. Until 120. Thank yeah. you so much, Alan. Thank you all out there for joining us. Thank you for those watching on Zoom, on YouTube, on Facebook. Thank you through the whole world that's watching us. Have a very good evening. Alan, God bless you. Zai Thank you. Zai. God bless you too. Thank you.